This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles, a 1,000-year odyssey. So tell me, muse, of the plant of many resources, which wander far and wide the ancient plant of food, fuel, and fiber cultivated for the millennia. As we venture through the past 10,000 years, we will explore and discover the plant from which cannabis derives. The many uses of the plant, hemp, cannabis hashes, cannabis in religion, cannabis in medicine, cannabis and dear old Uncle Sam, and so our odyssey begins today. Not long ago and far away, it begins today on the Big Island. And for any of you that don't know, the Big Island is the island of Hawaii, and it's called the Big Island because it really is big. I mean, you know, you could gather up all the other islands and sit them down on the Big Island, and there'd be room to spare. And so we are talking today with Steve Salak, I hope I got that pronounced right. And Steve is the co-founder and CEO of Manana Artesian Botanicals, as well as owner of Ho'onau'a Farm. And he is also one of the co-founders, I think that's right, of the farm that got the contract from the state of Hawaii from the Department of Agriculture to develop hemp seeds so that the seed is now endemic to Hawaii. So hopefully I got some of that right. And good morning, Steve. Thank you so much. Good morning, Marcia. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, let, let me just, can I, can I help out a little bit? Please my, do. Uh, so Please. My, last name, my last name is Sakala. Sakala. Um, and, yeah, and, and the hemp uh, CBD business that I have is Mana Artisan Botanics. Uh, and the farm where I uh, have a little guest retreat and invite people to come and do educational opportunities is called Ho Now Now Farm. So, um, uh, you, you know, lots of lots of vowels in there, um, but uh, we certainly enjoy uh, the diversity of all all the places that we get to be. So you live there at the the farm where you have the retreat. Correct. Ho Now Now Farm is my home as well as uh, our retreat center. Correct. So now you look like a very young man. Where do you find time for all of these ventures? Uh, well, that's a really good question. I'm still trying to figure out the life uh, play balance right now. Um, my focus uh, has been mostly on developing the farm and the, uh, the hemp strains as well as the CBD business. Uh, luckily, I really enjoy what I do, and so I don't feel the need to, um, to, to do many other things because there's not really time to do them. So I, I love farming, I love working with cannabis. I've been in the cannabis industry over 20 years uh, and it's my passion along with sustainable farming. So uh, I get to do what I love. Well, now how did you get started in farming? You know, I, I had uh, both, my, both of my grandfathers, both on my mom's side and my dad's side, uh, both came directly from uh, farming families. And so it was, in, it was in my lineage, it was in my genetics, uh, I was exposed to those uh, family roots early on. And somehow, even though I grew up in the suburbs, uh, I caught the bug. And so uh, I studied natural resources in college with a little bit of agriculture uh, woven into that and sustainable systems. And really it was um, my, my broad interest in sustainability that took me to West Africa for four years uh, with the Peace Corps. And in my time living in West Africa in a hut, mud hut with a grass roof and a subsistence uh, culture in, in a very small village, I had the realization that agriculture is the foundation of all culture. And until we can really put our agriculture systems here in the West on a sustain, sustainable track and a sustainable path, almost all my other interests are secondary. And so uh, I dedicated uh, my passion in my life to creating um, sustainable agriculture systems. So is that what you mean by a purpose-driven business? 
Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Uh, and, and, you know, it's broader than that. Uh, you're, you're referring to the mission statement uh, with Mono Artists and Botanics. Yes. Um, you know, not only are we wanting to promote a sustainable cannabis industry, we also wanted to create really high-end products that people um, could get a sense of what Hawaii has to offer from our agriculture. Uh, in addition to that, we wanted to create products that brought wellness um, and communicated a story of Hawaii and the wellness that, um, you know, the Hawaiian Islands are known for. So there's so many different aspects of what that purpose is, but the sustainable agriculture is certainly a big piece of that. Well, so... That is how it all started. That's where you began this venture. So how did you discover or reach with the CBD? Let's start with CBD. Sure. Well, so I was um, uh, already a medical grower here in Hawaii. I had been for many years. and uh, A, a friend, medical uh, grower was, means uh, a cannabis, a medical grower? Yes, cannabis. a medical cannabis grower, correct, yeah. I, just a little bit of history, I actually worked on the first medical marijuana initiative and hemp initiative in California in 1992 with uh, Jack Herrera, and he really, you know, the emperor wears no clothes is where I really got my awareness of what hemp and cannabis has the potential to do for our planet and for our human species. Uh, and so my, my journey on cannabis started very young at 17. Uh, of course, I worked on the, it didn't pass in 1992, but it passed in 1996. So I pretty much became a medical grower uh, as soon as we were able to legally um, after that pass. Fast forward to Hawaii, uh, I'm growing medical cannabis and working uh, my very diverse permaculture farm. And a friend comes to me who's working with a woman who has cancer and says, have you heard of CBD? And this is about eight or nine years ago. And uh, having been in cannabis so long, I was surprised and uh, a bit skeptical. I said, no, but let me check it out. Well, that was the beginning of the journey. I, I dove into the research around CBD. Uh, of course, it was discovered by uh, Rafael Michulovic in Israel. And uh, the research was not numerous, but certainly we knew that CBD had the majority of the health benefits of cannabis related to CBD, not THC. And so uh, I began to grow a CBD-rich strain and share it with friends and family, and it immediately was clear to me that this was the wave of the future, that the way people were impacting, uh, being impacted in their health and their well-being and their, men their mental states, uh, I just became really laser focused on what CBD could offer as a health benefit to the body. Now, I've heard pro and con, not about the benefits, but whether it's legal. Now, some people say it's legal in all 50 states, and other people say it's not. So where are we in that venture? I know you sell it, uh, and I've seen it sold online. So is it, yes. is it legal or not? And I, uh, I guess if it wasn't, we, you couldn't sell it online. That's right. It, 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 what we would call this is kind of um, a little bit of a gray area. Uh, but for all intents and purpose, purposes, yes, it is legal. Uh, and the reason that it's legal is because in uh, 2014, uh, the Obama administration helped usher through the 2014 Farm Bill. And in that Farm Bill, there was a hemp directive and a provision that allowed for states to enact uh, hemp programs for research and education. As a part of that hemp provision, there was the ability to, to study the commerce of hemp that was grown in these legal states. So, but it was the 2014 Farm Bill that is allowing for the hemp to be uh, sold and grown legally under state law. So that's that's what gives us the um, the ability to to sell CBD legally. So you can grow the plant and extract the CBD. Is that correct? Yes, if if you are in a state that has a hemp program. No, I meant here in, in Hawaii. Uh, so in Hawaii, we are still in the early stages of our hemp development program. Um, so we're growing hemp under a state contract. They paid us to do some research and acclimatization studies. Um, there are now a few people that also have hemp permits outside of the tr contracts. Unfortunately, um, there yet has yet to be a CBD variety approved by the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. And so there are no hemp, uh, CBD hemp strains growing in Hawaii yet uh, that can be extracted. We're hoping that 
we have a CBD hemp strain that's uh, approved by the Board of Agriculture in the next few months, so that by next season uh, that will be the case. So the uh, CBD comes from the cannabis plant, is that correct? Or, or all of these come from the same plant? What's the, tell me, what's the difference in a cannabis yeah. plant and a hemp plant? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's a lot of misinformation that gets swirled around that question. Uh, from the botanical point of view, from the scientific point of view, hemp is in the cannabis family. Uh, it is the exact same genetic plant. Uh, the difference comes uh, when you take into the man-made construct of what uh, we define as hemp, and that is traditionally it's been a fiber crop. So the hemp plants grew very tall and lanky, and they was, those were harvested for fiber or seed for food or hemp oil, as in the seed oil for, you know, uh, the omegas and things you put in your salad dressing. Uh, since the 2014 Farm Bill, we have bred down some of the high THC cannabis plants to become hemp plants that have high CBD. Most hemp plants that you grow for fiber or seed do not have high levels of CBD. They have small levels, and you can, you can get industrial uh, hemp and extract it and get a little bit of CBD, but it's not very high-quality CBD. It's not what I would consider to be a medicinal-grade CBD. Um, and so now that we've bred new hemp strains, which are, by definition, in, in, in America at least, 0.03% THC. It's a man-made designation. Um, and so anything with a 0.3% less uh, THC is considered hemp, and so now we've developed these high CBD strains that qualify as hemp. Uh, and so the strains we use in like Mono Artist and Botanics products and that many of the people are using for these high CBD products are really a high-grade hemp plant that's grown just like med medicinal cannabis, females only, a high resin content, really nice terpene profiles, and that's what we're putting into our, our Mono products, uh, as many of the other companies are doing as well. Okay, now you just said something that, how do you tell a male from a female plant? I mean, I understand that the plants understand, but how do you understand? Yeah, so it's a really clear indication. Uh, female plants have pistils or hairs, uh, just like a lot of other female flowers and a lot of the uh, other plant kingdom families. And the males have pollen sacs. So as you begin to grow a plant, uh, there's ways to sex them early and find out if they're a female or a male because you don't necessarily want to grow out a big male plant uh, when you're really focused on females. So the, the male plants have little pollen sacs and the females develop pistils and then that's how you can tell the difference. And so that as they grow, you separate them so that they don't cross pollinate? Yeah, in our case, when we're doing CBD hemp, unless we want to pollinate for seed for next year's crop, um, all the males get weeded out. Um, or taken down or cut down and used uh, for compost or biomass for other reasons. Oh, poor uh, and only the female plants are used for the high quality CBD. Oh, hmm. boo. <laughs> anyway. Well, yeah, because <laughs> just, just, like just like in medical cannabis, <clears throat> you don't want male plants around because they create seeds, and seeds take away from the high potency of the resin content of a female plant. So it's the same for growing a CB, a high, a high concentration of CBD. Um, you want as much of that resin content to put into a medicinal product as you can. But if they're pollinated with a bunch of seed, it's much more difficult to get that really high grade um, product. So once you cut down the male plant, can you use it for something else? I mean, you don't. You just know, if throw you it away. You, you could. I don't. I use it for compost. Uh -huh. um, but in a commercial operation, let's say on the mainland somewhere, like in Colorado. Those male plants could potentially go to a biomass uh, uh, project uh, or a fiber project, but it's unlikely that that happens because um, really the fiber, the fiber plants grow much differently than, um, than we're growing our CBD plants. So the, potentially you could turn it into a hempcrete. That would be a really great use of a male, a male plant when it's cut down. We've had several people told me to be sure to ask you about hempcrete. So we need to take a break and we'll come back in 60 seconds and then tell us about Hemp Creek. Okay? Be right back. Will do. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. 
Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Aloha, and we're back. And Steve is going to tell us all about the hemp plant. And I was asking Steve if about hemp uh, concrete or hempcrete, where you use it as a building product. Tell us about that, how, how we go from the plant to hempcrete and, and then to a building product. Yeah, so um, hempcrete is actually a fairly simple process. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential for hempcrete um, a, a, as a building material and a sustainable material. Uh, you know, it hasn't been tried and true uh, here in Hawaii, so there's still some question marks about the long-term viability of, uh, of the material here in Hawaii with our high humidity and our high moisture levels. But I do know that they built a uh, demonstration home over in Maui with hempcrete. So, you know, I would say over the next three to five years, we'll have a pretty good idea of how that's holding up uh, for our tropical environment. But in general, hempcrete is basically just the, the pit, the fiber part, uh, the woody inside of the hemp plant mixed with lye. And um, that creates a very uh, stable building material, very low cost. Uh, if, it if it turns out to be something that holds up well to humidity and moisture, uh, it's going to be a really great economic bio, economically viable way to do sustainable building here in Hawaii. So we're really excited about that potential with hempcrete. Now, where is this house that was built in on Maui? That's a really good question. Uh, I haven't get, I haven't got to see it in person, um, but if you look up hempcrete house Maui uh, online, that should give you some pictures. I know they've done some tours of it, uh, so I don't know exactly where it's located though, off the top of my head. Okay, let's go back to the hemp uh, development. You got the contract from the Department of Agriculture, State Department of Agriculture, to create yeah. a seed that's endemic to Hawaii. Tell us about that. Well, so just, to, just to, to clarify, endemic means native to Hawaii. So we're not trying to create an endemic seed. We're trying to create an acclimatized seed. Acclimatized, So we, okay. we're trying to create... Yeah, trying to create seeds that are acclimatized to the Hawaiian um, uh, climate as well as our day links. The, the challenge in that, Marcia, is that um, typically cannabis does much better and is more typically grown at northern latitudes. Uh, so being that we're closer to the equator, our day length don't change as dramatically, and there's not as clear as signals to the cannabis plant of when to be in vegetative growth and when to be in flowering. Um, so we are, have been experimenting with the seeds that the state provided us, which were from China. Um, it was a fiber and seed variety for food. And that, did, that seemed to do very well here, the Yuma variety. That's the seed that's approved for those that receive a hemp permit to, to grow at the moment. It's the only seed that's approved. The other varieties we're testing are either varieties that we brought in from other locations or we had been developing under our medical licenses. And so far, um, it's been a little bit more challenging than we had hoped to get a CBD variety that would adapt, but we're still diligently working on, um, on developing those so that we have something in the very near future for farmers to be able to plant in the field without lights and grow CBD here in Hawaii. Um, so far, what we have found is that the CBD varieties want longer days so that they stay in vegetative growth before they go to flower which for us means additional lighting. And um, on a large scale, we, we don't feel like that's sustainable. So we're really trying to develop a variety that can grow without additional lighting. And so instead of three crops a year, they, li they would like two crops a year, the plant itself, or one. Yeah, you know, 
Yeah, one would be the you know like in Colorado or California or anywhere uh, on on the mainland, um, they get one crop a year in the field. We're hoping to get maybe two or three, um, especially with the fiber and the seed variety. With the CBD variety, it will be difficult to to pull off two or three crops unless um, unless there's additional lighting. So if you uh, did it indoor, when, yeah, if you had a closed um, nursery with artificial light. A closed nursery or, or right, or, or a, a greenhouse type of environment where you could hang lights and, and do, you know, it, it's not a lot of lighting, but it is going to require infrastructure. They usually require about three to four additional hours of light on top of our normal day lights here in Hawaii so that they stay in vegetative growth and get to the size that makes it commercially viable to, to extract from. So a solar wouldn't do because that's still the same amount of sunlight. Uh, well, if you were really in a sunny spot and you had a solar system and could store that energy in a nice battery bank, I mean, the battery technology is certainly getting better and better um, all the time. Uh, that would be one way to do it more sustainably is to run a big solar system and battery bank to run those lights. So now you have, how many people have a license? Well, so to, I mean, for the seed about, they, to, to develop like you do from <clears throat> in yeah. terms of right there was research. Three, there was three of us. Three, so on yeah, different three, islands. Three teams. Yeah, exactly. The UH, mm -hmm. uh, they're on Oahu, got one of the contracts. Uh, another gentleman and his team on Maui got one of the contracts. Mm -hmm. And then my partner and I got one of the contracts here for the Big Island. Okay, so that would mean the different soil and the different climate, of course. Those. Yes, correct. Now. Yeah. As my understanding is, UH did not test any CBD varieties. They were only testing the Yuma variety. So they weren't doing any development of seeds. They were only testing the seed that the state asked them to grow, which wasn't ideal because it would have been really great to have an Oahu team that um, did some stuff outside of just the one seed. But that's the way that they did their experiment. Uh, the gentleman and his team in Maui did some experiments with multiple varieties in Oahu, uh, in Maui, and uh, and so they did get some seed out of that. I don't know how the CBD variety did, unfortunately. I don't think it did very well. Uh, you know, we had the volcano here that definitely threw off our season as well. So it wasn't necessarily the best test of what was possible. But uh, yeah, essentially the three teams have been testing the seeds in different environments. Okay, so now you are, again, since it is a big island, you're not close to Puna where the volcano erupted? No, uh, we are on the other side of the island. So my farm is in South Kona, mm -hmm. and then the farm where we're doing some the hemp acclimatization and research studies is uh, is near um, the southern part of the island. Oh, okay. Near so, South Point. So you didn't get yeah. any of the storm damage and the volcano damage? No. Gratefully, uh, we escaped any storm damage, uh, oh, and, you know, the volcano certainly created a really challenging air quality situation for us, oh. but we weren't in any immediate danger of, um, of lava. But the, yeah, but the air quality was just horrible for everybody. I mean, you know. It, 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 was, it, was, it was unprecedentedly terrible. I mean, um, I, I, it really was a major challenge to kind of deal with that. Unfortunately, I didn't have any cannabis in flower, um, and nothing on my farm here in South Kona seemed to suffer too much. But I, you know, of course, we know a lot of friends over on the Hilo side in Puna that uh, really took uh, big losses, either losing their farms or with the air quality. Oh yes, the the papaya, the orchids. Yeah, really tough on that. Yeah. yeah, especially with the papaya who loves that climate. Now they've got to figure out how to grow papaya someplace else. Right. Yeah. And so now, but getting to uh, your experimental farm, there's no problem of getting through the Puna district. I mean, you know, uh, traveling. Well, 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 you know, I don't, I don't have to, tr I don't have to drive through the Puna district to get from my place to South Point. Luckily, so it's um, it's only about a 45 minute drive, but it's straight down the west side here. So, oh, okay. Um, none, never had a problem getting to the farm, which has been good. Very good. So other than the atmosphere, no no other damage? Yeah, thankfully no other damage. Okay, real quick, let's go back up to Kona. 
and tell us about uh -huh. your retreat. Yeah, so I've been developing Ho Now Now Farm for about the last 11 years. Uh, when I bought the farm, it was a macadamia nut farm, and so I um, slowly began taking the macadamia nut trees down and diversifying with fruit trees and gardens and, um, and a lot of medicinal uh, plants as well as spice trees. So now I have a little model here that uh, is a demonstration of what uh, I would like to see more of uh, here in Hawaii, which is the diversified agriculture model. Um, and so I have milking goats and milking sheep. I have chickens and ducks, uh, lots of turmeric and mamaki and other medicinal plants in addition to the, to the cannabis. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we invite people to come and do education programs with us and stay with us in our, in our short-term uh, vacation rentals. Uh, and enjoy the farm atmosphere and kind of get a more true experience of what Hawaii, um, Hawaii has to offer beyond uh, the tourist scene. Dr. Doolittle, huh? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> it, you know, you wear many hats to make it in Hawaii, and so uh, this one has been uh, a, a really great experiment with small-scale agriculture. I, I am I'm delighted that you're doing this, and I do want to come visit. How do you... Uh, move that out to the rest of Hawaii because we're we need this on each island. We need the diversified agriculture. We need yeah. the retreat. Uh, all of those things. How do we move it from where you are to the rest of the, uh, the rest yeah, of the state? Yeah, you know, I, I would say there, there's models on each of the island that already exist. The problem is just um, really making it, it known where where those models are so that people can visit them and and be inspired by them, I hope. You know, how do we inspire people to live a more sustainable existence here on these islands? Um, but my work with the Hawaii Farmers Union United is a really great way to connect with what's going on statewide. So I encourage folks to get involved, even if you're not a farmer, if you appreciate the, the food that's grown here in Hawaii, get involved with Hawaii Farmers Union United. We're, we're doing really great things to uh, affect policy at our legislative level, as well as putting on really great local events. We're about to have our annual convention uh, over in Maui in October, the end of October, with some really great speakers. Um, so there's a really great way to be educated about diversified agriculture and sustainable agriculture is through uh, those types of programs. And then, um, you know, it really is about getting the word out so people can support the farmers that are doing this type of agriculture. Uh, we need people to buy products that understand the value of what goes into making a sustainable value-added product from diversified agriculture. It's, it's, not, <clears throat> it's not the same model as monoculture where you can just drive your tractor, harvest it, and process it for a very low cost. Uh, it's a much higher cost. We have to make a living and pay our mortgages and, you know, our utilities and, uh, and, and make an existence here. So, you know, hoping to get people to realize the true value of food and paying a little extra for locally grown food uh, makes a big difference for us farmers. Well, this has been a real pleasure spending this time with you. Will you come back uh, during your conference and talk to us again about the Maui conference? Yeah, I would be delighted. That, I really appreciate you having me on today. I always love talking about uh, cannabis and hemp and what uh, we can really do with uh, those potentials here in Hawaii. So thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. Aloha. And we'll see you Aloha. next time.